Hi, welcome back everybody to Making Action Happen. I'm Sarah Blackhurst. And I'm Brian McCain. We've got Micah with us uh, this week because we're going to talk about the annual meeting that we just finished. Um, it was really, it was really, really great stuff. We experimented around a little bit with it to see um, on, on every front. We did it in a different town. So it was a town highlight that we did down in Trinidad. Um, it was it was super it was super interesting to have it down there. It was a whole lot of fun. We had a really great time. So much fun. So much, so fun. much fun. And a different format to how these meetings usually go. So you go to these meetings and it's like check in, go to your workshops, usually at a convention center or at a hotel. And then half the time during these meetings, at least my experience, you check in. You go to one little meeting for 30 minutes and then everybody leaves. Yeah. And then yeah. they come back for another, yeah. the lunch or whatever. So we did it different. We did it different. So this is what we, I wanted to create an experience this year, uh, in part because I was bored. Um, and in part because we were doing it in Trinidad and I wanted everybody to come together, but I wanted it to just be fun. So we did a couple of goofy things. We, um, so Chad Borthman, I know you're listening because you always do. We did the Chad Borthman button because he wasn't going to be there. I decided, well, it was Micah's idea. Let's blame it on Micah. Um, <laughs> we were sitting around trying to think of how we were going to make this event different than other events or to really stand out. And we, we were talking about the power of having fun together. And so uh, Chad was on vacation, sort of. Uh, he was down for the launch and um, him and his family. And Garen, who's been on our show a couple of times, uh, they they had invitations to go to the launch of Lucy um, at uh, in down in Florida, and then they were on vacation. So I decided to have Chad Borthman buttons, and everybody was wearing Chad Borthman buttons. And the governor wore his Chad Borthman button for his entire um, speech. Uh, the the AG wore it. Everybody was wearing Chad Borthman buttons. The other thing that we did was the potato, and this is so goofy. <laughs> I don't know where I came up with this idea, but I decided somewhere along the line that we needed to hand Commissioner, County Commissioner Tony Haas, everybody needed to hand him a potato. So it was very confusing time, <laughs> registration, where people were like, I'm supposed to hand this to Tony. Um, and yes, they were supposed to hand it to Tony. It was this really great icebreaker. So we did some goofy stuff but what i found was it was not just a great icebreaker but it was kind of a bonding yeah. thing yeah. yeah everyone got to share that joke a little bit yes everybody got to share in it <laughs> share uh, the confusion a little bit and i guess that chad got lots of pictures of people with their buttons and so did garen only two people asked what happened they're like is this a memorial <laughs> oh he's fine he's fine he's fine <laughs> like are we remembering him like no 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 he's <laughs> He's in Florida right now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he's no longer with us. He's just in Florida. <laughs> he's just he's just yeah, just not here now. Um, and then uh, Connie, um, Tony Haas's wife, called me last. We bonded with these people. Oh yeah, like big no, they're, time. They're part of the family. Now. They're yeah, totally part of the family. Um, Connie told called me last night and was like, "I just have to tell you this story." So I guess when he was. Um, I, on Friday, when he was getting ready to leave, like we couldn't figure out where all his potatoes went, uh -huh. some sweet little lady came to him and said, I'm sorry, I just couldn't give you my potato. And, you know, <laughs> and in the Tony Haas way, um, he goes, well, why not, young lady? And because he calls everybody a young lady. Why yeah. not, young lady? And he goes, she goes, my, my daughter loves potatoes just so much. I wanted to take my potato. So he gave his bag of potatoes. What? Of course he did. And then he's like, well, I don't have to take these home now. Yeah, yeah. that's a win-win for him. Yeah. So the rest of the potatoes we took to him the next day. That's, yeah. <laughs> but he yeah. gave his potatoes to this lady who just wanted to take her potato to her daughter. Yeah. It was just I great. Didn't know, I didn't know about that one. Yeah. I didn't well, know that's Connie they... just called, called me last night to tell me that because Tony would have never told us this story because it would have sounded like bragging. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he never would have. So this year when you set up the annual meeting, again, it usually goes two days, right? Traditionally, the annual meeting yes. is two days. We do breakout sessions. You register. You sit in a room. You hear a speaker. You go to like, I'm going to learn about water. I'm going to learn about this. So this year, um, Sarah's idea was to do it different and have more of a, almost like an entertaining section of the meeting. 
Yes. Right. Yeah. So what what we did was we set up basically TED talks, but we call them action talks. Yeah. And everybody came to an auditorium, which first off was really great because I hate sitting at a table in a conference room listening to people speak. So this was an auditorium. Everybody could be comfortable. And you had a series of speakers throughout the first day, yes. followed by a reception and then a post reception and then a post post reception <laughs> and then a post 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 reception. So but many. but what it was, it, there was it, a pre reception. Too. Yeah. So it was the the first day was you go to this auditorium at Trinidad State University and we had a myriad of speakers all speaking completely different things and mixed it up. And the feedback we got from that was it was different and it was entertaining. And you had people get up and like go to the bathroom or, you know, they see people and they go talk in the back or whatever. But for the most part, the way that this was set up that first day, it held everybody's attention. And we don't know how. Yeah. And then the second day was kind of like the meat and potatoes. It's like, yeah. hey, th this is like the technical details. And it was interesting because the first day was a completely different group of people than the second day. That was interesting. It, like there, there were people that wanted to show up for the talks, but not necessarily like the workshops and right. then vice versa. And, and I thought that was interesting. But again, we had a huge entertaining group of speakers from all walks of life. And that was the best feedback I got from it was we sat there and this was fun right. and I learned something. There was a takeaway from it. So what, why'd you do that? Why'd you want to do that? Well, I wanted, I wanted it to be an experience. I wanted it to be something different and I wanted it to feel like everybody had a part to play mm -hmm. in that, but I had no idea how this was going to go. When we were sitting there and looking to see how that was going to happen, I was like, should we give a, should we give a break? And you're like, no, nope, let's just let it go. Yeah. And then you and I looked at each other um, at one point, Micah, and Micah's like, do you realize we've all been sitting here for three hours? Yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe how that time just went by. It ended up being four full hours. We sat there. Four full hours. And yeah, I mean, to Brian's point, people got up and moved around a little bit, but really just yeah. came right back. Like it wasn't, yeah. I mean, usually we're all looking, for, I have the worst attention span of anybody. Yes. We're all looking for reasons to get up and, like excuse ourselves for a few minutes. No, it was it was great. Like I, and the speakers, the variety, it was all wonderful. Well, and the other thing is I really wanted, because um, I started my comments and I've never done this before where I had prepared comments. Like mm -hmm. I don't, I usually am totally off the cuff, but I really wanted to set the tone of for the entire day. And I wanted everybody, whatever their perspective was, to think about somebody else's perspective, first of all. And secondly, um, that this whole idea of we've got to start building Colorado as a team. Yes. I've been, since the legislative session, and I know it was at the beginning of the year, but since the legislative session, one of the things that's bothered me is how everybody wants to serve their team and that team isn't Colorado. Yes. That's how it feels to me. And so all of the speakers, regardless of whether I would agree with their perspective, or even if I would have normally picked them out um, to do that, I had them come in because I thought it was gonna speak to somebody. And this was the interesting part. So we'll go through in just a second, you know, what we our takeaways from each of the speakers. But um, one of the ones that I was totally not expecting, and we had a really impressive lineup, but I'd never met Jamie Rico before. Mm -hmm. I was not prepared for the very touchy feely sort of stop and and enjoy the like have a feeling right that second. It made me really uncomfortable to say the tr to say truth. I wasn't I wasn't good with that. Um, and but I looked around and people were into it. Yeah. And it was that's a really difficult thing because the way it fell out, the governor ended up, I had to move him up. He was supposed to be the finale. We had to move him up because of his time constraints. So he went right back or he was, he went right before her as right. it ended up. Um, and she still had the audience. It yeah. was the craziest thing. And of the feedback that I got, I can, I ranked, I was kind of keeping track of who gave me what feedback on what. And I think she would have been the number three as far as positive feedback. She might be higher on my list, honestly, as far as like, like unsolicited feedback from people as far as you know what they liked about the conference and stuff. 
I heard her name over and over again. It was yeah. like honestly, it's from like an order standpoint. I almost wish that we had put her earlier. Yeah, yeah, like put her in the middle. Almost. Yeah. Well, and she told me I, I talked to her a bit before and then after because um, she came at it. She's a, a therapist basically, um, but that that's minimalizing what she does. She she's very educated and specializes in multiple areas. She works out of Colorado Springs, and she was like, you know, I don't want to do like here's what I do, here's what needs to be done. It was more like, hey, we're going through a rough time, everybody's feeling this, but what's important is we have each other, and I know that's cliche to say, but then she ended with a song, of course, and <laughs> danced up there. We were all looking but, at But it other. was great, it was great. People were standing up and clapping along. Um, I, of course, have no emotion when it comes to music and songs, even though I play <laughs> music and sing and stuff, but um, no, no, it was, it was awesome, and she was very, her tone was very almost serious, but not so serious. The The point was like, this is serious, but don't take it so serious and look to each other for help and um, support during these times. And I know, and, and talking to her after, and I don't mean to speak on behalf of somebody else, but you know, COVID hit her pretty hard because all she does is work with people and try to get them through rough times. And she was seeing people that were having a lot of rough times from, children on up and being somebody that does that and then they're stopped from doing that. And she said it, she's like, I don't, I don't guide you through this. I walk with you through it. And she kept saying that. And then when COVID hit and all this stuff was going on, she could not walk with people to it through this. And it's just as important for her clients to walk with her as it is for her to walk with her clients. Oh, and yeah. that's the point she was trying to make. Like, it hit her really hard. You know, she was, she was alone. She couldn't see her clients. She's worried about them. And that was the whole point of her, her talk was basically to say like, we can get through this. We're getting through this, but we got to look out for each other. Um, unless I'm wrong. She could, no, you know, no. no and, I, and I think it was a really interesting take on the same type of topic. I mean, it's so outside the box for what you'd expect from an annual meeting that features a lot of political heavyweights. Right. Political and technical. And, like, yeah. Tech, yeah. Yeah. Technical heavyweights, and yeah. For her to come in and, and kind of have that perspective, but it was still, it was still like there was a cohesiveness to it too, because it was like we're this is us, it's we are doing this. Yeah, yeah. It was crazy how it all worked together. So let's talk about um, let's talk about the speakers because we had a hell of a lineup. Yes. Yeah, so um, kicking it off for the action talks, you know, we had Sarah spoke to introduce everybody, followed by Phil Weiser, the Colorado Attorney General. And he, he kind of spoke about opioids a little bit, but it was basically him looking out for uh, rural Colorado with yeah. some of the stuff he's done, yeah. working with Action 22. Um, then we had Randy Gratishar, Orange Crunch, uh, Crush, Orange Crunch, <laughs> <laughs> Orange Crush <laughs> from the Broncos back in the, the 70s and early 80s. And he basically just gave his life story. And one surprising thing was that his family's from Pueblo, yeah. which makes sense with his name. Then, of course, um, Dr. Rana Epper, uh, the Trinidad State, the president, um, she spoke just at the state of Trinidad State and the issues they're dealing with from having this extremely old school and funding and what's funded and what's not, but why it's important. Followed up by my buddy Bob McLaughlin from Mount Carmel, and I had him throw an audible, and uh, you know he was going to give his speech on you know what Mar Mount Carmel's doing for Pueblo and Trinidad because they have uh facilities in both areas in colorado springs but he basically went through what made him the person he is today and he went through you know service in the military and being the garrison commander of fort carson and people he saw pass away and then i, I really appreciated this that it was uh giving people a second chance for messing up because if you don't you know he told the story of doc his buddy that served underneath them, uh, NCO, that could have been kicked out for an incident, but they didn't. And then he saved so many lives and unfortunately ended up dying mm -hmm. in combat later. Then uh, yours truly spoke after him. I, I did my art spiel that we've heard about. And then uh, Tanya Drake. Yeah. Uh, she's the Northwest Chancellor from the WGU out of Washington, which is the Western. Western Governors University. Yeah. And she basically spoke on on education and um, you know what makes it important, what they can do to change it, what they're doing right and wrong. Then we had uh, Mr. James Eklund come in, 
and anybody in water knows him. He, he basically gave a presentation on Colorado's water basins, what it looks like for the future, how it's not as bad as we think, but not as good as we think either. Um, then Jamie Rico, mm -hmm. she spoke and, and we spoke about what she said, but she, she was great. And then Micah, mm -hmm. he came out after that talking about what we can do better for education in Colorado and his experiences. Uh, and then Kevin O'Neill of the O'Neill Group spoke, and he does the Catalyst Set, uh, Catalyst Campus up in Colorado Springs, and it's mostly like small business innovation and incubator, but focused on defense contracts and cybersecurity, aerospace and stuff, and how they're moving into Southern Colorado. I think they already have some grant applications in for Pueblo, and then they're talking to Trinidad State as well, um, and then. Governor Polis, he went earlier than that, but he was kind of the supposed to be the the crown on the this the whole day, but he went in the middle of that. And he he basically he I'll give him props. He spoke about being united in rural Colorado with Denver and we all you know, Team Colorado, the same goals. And he did the one thing that I would never let my boss do back in the day. He asked <laughs> questions <laughs> to a not so friendly audience. And um, you know. He, he did a good job. Yeah. Um, he he answered the questions. Uh, we we had to cut it eventually because would have went on forever. But there there were some people and some higher up people that were at the meeting that had some real concerns about what they're seeing and going through, and they called him out on it. Yeah. And he did answer. He, I mean, he actually he looked at job, him and actually. answered him. And, yeah. and that was I appreciate that. Um, I'm so used to like. A senator, a congressman, governor, whoever coming in and doing their 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, thank you, bye. And then leaving, yeah. he actually answered questions to the point where we had to cut him off for time constraints. Um, and, and that was it. That was our action talks. And they all spoke for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then we went to Phil Long to Toyota. After that. So let's just let's start back at the top of the list with Phil Weiser. I have to tell you, um, for our listeners, and I don't know what the word is, when you have a colleague who you consider like your affection and respect for them is a friend. It's a friendship, but it's a colleague. I don't know if we have a word that really adequately addresses that, but that's really Phil Weiser. He's been such a great friend and colleague um, for us and for Action Twenty Two. So um, we got to visit the night before a little bit and talked about, you know, what we were trying to accomplish with the action talks and. He's always so good at asking questions with real intent. Mm -hmm. So he's like, what are you trying right. to do here? What do you want? He is a lawyer. And he's a lawyer. Um, and, you know, he's he's does an excellent job of sort of ignoring party and focusing on Colorado. And I yeah. think he's one of our most outstanding elected officials in that respect. And so I said, we you know, we want to talk about this this whole team thing. Um, and he far and away unsolicited everybody, man, I just love Phil Weiser, just love Phil Weiser. Um, he did such a great job. And the takeaway was, yes, we've accomplished this, we've done this, we've done this, but it was a lot more. I felt than just a, a list of, of basically what he's done as, um, mm -hmm. as the AG. And of course, I like to always say it, he colors outside the lines of his mandate as the attorney general but he does a really good job. I don't know, what were your takeaways? Well, no, I mean, you, you can always see, there, there's never been a doubt in my mind dealing with, with Phil Weiser about uh, how genuine he is yeah. in his intent. Yeah. Um, you know, he's not just, like you say, he's not just blowing smoke. He's not just saying what people want to hear. He's saying what he actually believes in, and that does kind of toe some lines and stuff. Um, but I will say, I think my, this is, and, I, and I've been around him a few times, and I've always, you know, respected what he had to say. This was one of the most inspired I've felt from what he had to say. Like he really kind of pumped everyone about, you know, what direction we we are going, could be going, what successes we're we should expect going forward. Yeah. I was it was it was the most like I said I think that was the most inspirational talk I've heard from Phil Weiser. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. What'd you take away? Yeah, um, you know I don't agree with Phil on some things, and I agree with him totally on other things. But I think he genuinely cares about the Action 22 area and like helping people out down here. And he's finding solutions to help people. And he's finding solutions out of the Denver metro area for Southern Colorado and, and actually rural Colorado all the way around. So, he, you know, what, what he said, I, I know a lot of people in the audience probably didn't vote for him and don't agree with him on a lot of stuff, 
but they agreed with what he said at the talk and they they really appreciate him and he is paying attention and he's doing what he can do and again it, it's with action 22 you know we call him he answers oh like, absolutely uh, every time yeah uh, so so it was good and, and you're right it was kind of like a it, it was good in the divisive times where you have somebody that people may not consider like on their side of the aisle come out and tell him is like i'm with you like all the way you're like you know what he's right and and that hit the people that you know may not agree with him and they're like he actually does care so yeah. I, I really appreciate that um well and he doesn't this is the thing i guess that he doesn't have to show up to everything he doesn't have no. to do all that he would win he won by 56 percent, not like a 56 percent margin yeah not 56 percent of the vote he won by a 56 percent margin oh. which is huge yeah. yeah so he whether he had the rural vote or not he would he would probably win right yeah um, he doesn't have to come down here he doesn't have yeah. to and he, yeah. he didn't come down here to campaign he came nope. down here to actually say what he's doing to help people out and i appreciate and, that and to help them dial into that um, plus he's a nerd Oh, yeah, we super are. nerd. Nerds, we so, love so. we love nerds in this yeah. outfit uh, for sure. Um, Randy Gratishar was just a super sweet guy. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. such a super sweet guy, and he was he was saying that he didn't realize that his dad had been born in Pueblo until yeah. after he was drafted. Right, worked at the mill, and yeah. were, and that his dad worked at the mill, mm -hmm. and his granddad worked at the mill, yep. and they went to ended up going to Detroit to work in mills, and that's where he yeah grew up and didn't have any idea. Yeah. Um, and so and his son was with him, and he was really lovely. But it was I didn't know that was a son. That yeah, was a that son. was his son. Oh, okay. His son came with him. He was a little bit nervous because he yeah. was in a boot, and so. Um, I, I felt bad. I tried to help him up on the stage, and he thought I was going to shake his okay. hand. And I was like, "No, no, I'm really like helping you up." And then when he came down, I was like, "Come on, I got you." Yeah. And yeah. he could see he was like, "I don't need help." And then he's right. like, "Okay, thank you." Yeah. <laughs> After that, but well, th yeah, that it was, was a big step up to that stage. No, it yeah. was. It yeah. was. Like, it was if, a big if you're step not up. In a walking boot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And with well, he doesn't have short little legs, but for me, for my short little legs, it was yeah, it was a step up. Um. So and he just did a really sweet sort of setting the tone of being a leader and just how to how to do things right. So he was really great. And it was really um, it's Phil Long's. Um, who is it that I mean, that actually sponsored so that Randy could come down here. Um, it was Phil Long's people. Yeah. So, oh, now I'm working on it. I yeah. know. It's, yeah, it's, it's I like get, it's I their foundation. And we'll, we'll go it's over the foundation. We're going to go over all the sponsors. Yeah. On this too, yeah. To thank everybody, because there was a lot of people that you know, supported this, participated yeah. in it, and helped us put this on. And that's so important. And it was such, it, it made it so much better. Yeah. Um, and then who spoke after? Phil Long Enterprise is what they Phil call it. Phil Long Enterprise. Phil Long Toyota of Trinidad and Phil Long Enterprise. Yep. Okay. Um, so who was who spoke next after? I can't remember now. I'm um, going back to the page. Um, so that was Phil Weiser, Randy Kessler. Oh, Dr. Epper spoke oh, after Oh my that. gosh. Another one we fell in love with. Fell in love with like Dr. Her, Epper. We her. We, she's great, she's yeah. but man. Action 22 member. Um, she's been around uh, not for very long. She hasn't been at Trinidad, but maybe two years, three yeah. years. Yeah. It hasn't been. And she's done tremendous work down there. Just lovely, lovely, lovely. I have to say the co community college presidents that are mm -hmm. Action 22 members and that are part of the Action 22 area, just all are some of the most impressive people yeah. that we've come across. So um, I'll tell you my big takeaway from that one. This was the, believe it or leave it, this was the um, presentation, the talk that I got the most emotional about. With Dr. Eppers? With Dr. Eppers. Hmm. So the thing that she wanted to do is uh, she wants to update the um, the dorms. Right. Yeah. And so... All the other colleges in the state who went to the legislature to get this funded, and they can't get ARP funds for this, everybody else, she had a, a chart up there that they've been funded and how much they were spending per, per bed, per bed, per unit. Yeah. And then she shows what she's asking for and how much she would propose to spend. So we're talking... 78 million that was done or, you it, know, it, all this it was like 200,000 a 
bed yes, for it, like CU and then they were like half of that. I forget the numbers. It was 52,000. Yeah, it was way lower and, and it went down like, you know, CSU, UNC, you know, and then they were like at the bottom of how much it would actually cost for the, the, the students there. And it's and it would be a tremendous thing to help those students to have those dorms there mm -hmm. and all these other you know they've already been that money's already been designated from the legislature for other schools and here she is asking for a measly 17 million at yeah. 52,000 per unit as compared to 200,000 for other units at other yeah. schools and that's what made me emotional that kind of disparity made me like i choked back tears but they're gonna find it she'll find the money for it it's yeah. gonna be tough but a lot of it is philanthropy um grants and such things but i i think they'll they'll be fine um but they do need help with they that. do and need help, help with, that. with that but we we had the opportunity to go to her house or the president's house there and mm -hmm. it is it's one of two president's two house. Yeah. yeah i was like they can't pay for this this is her house and then she's like <laughs> no the school pays for it. I was like oh Sure. But she she's like, we're putting on the market. Yeah. We want to yeah. sell it and yeah. put it toward the dorms. She's like, there's no reason yeah. for us to have. And it's a beautiful home. It was designed for entertaining. It was designed for fundraising. Yeah, absolutely. And it was absolutely beautiful. And her husband's a hell of a bartender. He is. Milo is awesome. <laughs> some, some good Japanese whiskey that we, we don't drink too much of. Good <laughs> drinks and good entertainment. Yeah, we <laughs> fell in love with them up there. So when we come back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk, go through the rest of it, some of the takeaways. We're going to thank our sponsors, and we're going to talk about how we're going to um, sort of carry this through the next year of all the great things that happen with that. So stick around. Hi, this is Sarah. We're back with uh, the post game show for our annual meeting. Um, and I lied to you when I said that the one I got emotional about was um, Dr. Eppers. Um, Colonel McLaughlin had me shedding some tears yeah. over this one too. It was a big deal. I've been asking, I kept asking you and, and I know that um, the Colonel finally agreed. And I said, please just, I wanted him to talk about just his service and about all of that. Yeah. And his was way, it was way inspirational, um, I felt. And then I already knew this, but for some reason it landed harder with me this time is that 22, um, 22 veterans a day in this country complete suicide. And I heard him say complete, yeah. and I'd not <clears throat> understood that term before. And so you and I talked about it and you mm -hmm. said, it's because when they actually, that so many, there's so many attempts yeah. that veterans make so many attempts to commit suicide before they actually complete yeah. it. And um, it's important to point out that 22 is the national average, but in our area, it's higher than that. What yeah. is it? Um, I forget. You know, Matt Albright yeah. spoke about it on the show, but it's higher. I want to say it was like 28. Or, yeah, it, it was quite a bit higher. And that's basically the Fort Carson area. So is, that, is that a density of troops it's, here? It's, um, it's everything because still the, the highest suicide rate um, I don't know, like currently today, but up until just a few years ago, it was still Vietnam era veterans. Oh. So it wasn't just, you know, GWAT veterans. It was actually Vietnam era veterans still had the higher suicide rate. I think that may have changed, but um, this area, so Southern Colorado, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, basically the Action 22 area, it's higher than the national average yeah. on it. Uh, and then the one thing that people don't talk about, um, the Farm Bureau actually spoke about it. Sean did the second day was the suicide rate and mental health problems with the ag community as well. So, you know, back in the day, they always said, it's like, oh, what's the highest suicide rate? It's like dentists or police officers and stuff. But, you know, now it's it's really veterans and the ag community in rural areas and just rural. And, and that was surprising to me. I didn't, I yeah. had no idea about the, the ag community being that high rate. And in part, it makes absolute sense, but it's certainly something that, I mean, yeah, I'd never yeah. no, it's realized. It's really, really bad in Colorado right now. And also there's, and I don't know if anybody's crossed this over, but um, there's a lot of ag, of our ag community who are veterans. Sure. Yeah. And, and the ag rate has been high for a long time. Yeah. Um, just in, in my family out in Kansas, you know, we had three, three of my cousins commit suicide. 
Native farmers. And this was like years ago. This was this isn't recent. It, it was something that they were dealing with out in Kansas, where it was just like it was everything from actually to the point of like doing it and you know doing something bad by yourself to like running cars off the road. Um, the mental health aspect of it goes into like substance abuse and like wrecking cars, but intentionally wrecking them. But you know that my family's been talking about this for years because we had so many cousins that either attempted or succeeded in it and this is the 80s and 90s so this has been going on for a while and i'm glad to see that sean martini came and spoke about the program they're doing for yeah. um ag producers and it's actually for rural areas somebody asked is this specifically for ag and he's like you know it was originally but this is for all rural areas and and that was that was good and um he got a lot of good feedback on that too yeah um People are always surprised by that, but it's something that's just very, a real issue yeah. um, in the whole area. Uh, Bob re referenced a book um, by the, he was a um, Medal of Honor recipient. Oh, that was uh, Crawford. We have a statue oh, yeah. of him here in Pueblo. So yeah, and, and I know the story, I, I worked on those statues, but um, you know, Crawford was a Medal of Honor recipient still wanted the service community applied for a job at Fort Carson <laughs> didn't get it so he got one at the Air Force Academy as a, a janitor basically um, I think now it's a custodial technician or yeah. <laughs> like, no yeah. it's a, not a cowboy it's a <laughs> livestock technician but he he worked there and I heard this when I was at the Air Force Academy working there that you know the the cadets there were just like whatever like you know janitor blah, not paying any, att any attention so he worked there for three years so they realized that he was a Medal of Honor recipient. And then after that, I mean, it was like the red carpet for him the rest of the way. Sure. He never wanted that. Yeah. In fact, he, he showed the picture of Crawford because he never received the, the Medal of Honor because they thought he was um, KIA. So his parents received it, or his dad did, I think it was. And then Ronald Reagan, you know, they're like, oh, you know, the president's going to present the Medal of Honor to you. And he's like, no, I don't want it. He's like, it already went to my parents. I'm fine. And then he did the commencement speech. And they snuck him up on stage and President Reagan gave him his Medal of Honor and he was kind of bitter about that. But, <laughs> but it's such a great story. And, you know, Bob, we initially asked him to speak about Mark, Mount Carmel, like I said. And I was like, no, make it personal. And he made it personal. And it, it was, was great. great. And he, he really, when I was talking to him about that, he's like, you're sure this is okay? You're sure this is okay? I'm like, yes, do it. Because, you know, Mount Carmel is a member. Um, yeah. Jay Chimino founded Mount Carmel. And they're, they're big supporters of Action 22. And I get that for Bob to come down here as the director of Mount Carmel, he needs to tell people about Mount, Mount Carmel. And I said, they know about it. And if they don't, I'll tell them about it talk about you yeah like talk about you and why you're doing this and your road leading to this point and he did and it was a great was job great. and yeah. i really appreciate it he even texted me afterwards he was so worried because he had to take off right away he came from dc the night before and he's like was that okay Is, was that okay is it was that you know was that good like it was i'm worried so I was like, good no, dude, i was wiping was, tears was no it was so, so good and that was a i i kept kind of laughing to myself about how he was telling these stories where he dialed his own role in this like really cool story down so much oh, over yeah. and over, like yeah. the most humble way to tell these experiences. Mo True. Most people do not realize about Bob that he, when they were in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, he would be the first in. Mm -hmm. He was an officer, he said, he explained it to me one day, he's like, there's officers that lead from the back and they're safe. And there's officers that go straight in. And we went over like decisions he made that he may regret you know, just being an officer. And he said, you know what? I always went in first with everybody. And I think that's how it should be. And then he used some colorful words to describe other officers that may not have thought that way, but he was always front of the line with his troops. And he really thought about and considered his decisions that put people's lives in danger, caused deaths. And I'll tell you this, they haunt him to this day. Oh, I'm sure. They, they really do. And he, he told a great story um, on our UBC meeting about how there was a veteran that's part of Mount Carmel and they saw the signs and the veteran was going to commit suicide and they saved the veteran. Like they, he showed up and saved the veteran. So I can see him doing that. Yeah, he, he really day. does care. Um, really just great. Um, yeah. So we appreciate him so much and you work with him pretty 
close. Yes. You're working with him pretty closely. Yes. Um, Doug is our, you know, our Doug's, Doug is over there yep, now yep. too, and we we love him. Um, was James Eklund up next? No, it was me. But we can oh, skip right. over me. No, I've no, we're talked, not going to. No, skip. I've already talked about it. So we got. Let we'll me. We'll do just, a whole show on me. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's fine. So Brian so, spoke. Yeah. So, so Brian I spoke. spoke. Next was uh, tremendous feedback on that. But we'll Tanya, talk about Tanya that Drake. Oh, that's um, right. Yes. The, she flew in from Seattle yes. to do yeah. our action talks. That was that blew me away. That right. shows how important it is. So I my big takeaway from the Western Governors University is their approach to getting um, to getting people educated. Mm -hmm. This was really cool. So they do what thirty five hundred dollars. It's a competency, right? And it's basically an all you can eat, all you can learn buffet. Yeah. For a semester for uh, thirty five hundred. Thirty five hundred. Yeah. And just as much as you can get through. And I was like, maybe I should consider going back yeah, and doing that. Yeah, that's where that. I should have gone. But no, <laughs> seriously. But it's competency, and as soon as you show the competency, you move on. It's yeah. not like a semester because you they have so many students with life experience or whatever. Um, and they bring so much to the table. It's a really cool approach. And what I really liked later, and we'll talk about the O'Neill Group um, and what they're doing there. Um, we they got together, and there was some synergy that was really yep. created. That I they're going to be working together. You can tell, awesome. and um, yeah, some other things. So that was my big takeaway with her. But I just couldn't believe that um, she flew in. The Western Governors University yeah. flew it, flew her in to do that. On that note, too, that was something that's, that surprised me in a way, but I mean, very pleasantly surprised, is how much collaboration you saw happening Yeah. immediately after the meeting, all Friday, all Saturday. Oh, the yeah. The feedback I've gotten through phone calls and emails about, like that, like partnerships that just... Hey, that like, I didn't know you were doing this. Yeah. Like, we're doing this. We should talk after this. Yeah. Yeah. It blew me away. I mean, as far as a metric for success, like, I don't know if there's a better yeah. one. Yeah. Then after that was Mr. James Eklund. He's uh, with Eklund uh, Hanlon. They, they're water people. They're water people. As we call them in the industry. They're, they're water people. But... I love to have James Eklund at anything. I think the way he approaches explaining yeah. things is tremendous. I love his thought. But I have a lot of people who are not big fans of James Eklund. Mm -hmm. So here's the issue. I'm going to put it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. He knows all about water in Colorado. And there's very few of them that know. But yes. here's the issue, especially for our folks who aren't in Colorado and maybe for some of our folks in Colorado, the issue is property rights. Yes. So it's a property rights issue. Water yes. is a is a right, a property private right. Like property right. It's private property right. But then on the other side of the issue is something that makes us all very nervous, and that is water speculation. Yep. And also what he he spoke about was some legislation that's going to come up. Um, and I've heard this many times, um, Bob Rawlings, God rest his soul, would say like, you know, I'm all about private property, but you need to do something to stop people from selling their water, even though it's a private property right. Mm -hmm. And that's what Eklund was really focusing on is this legislation that would say you cannot sell water rights for profit for a certain amount of time. And he's coming from that aspect. He's like, no, this is a private property right. And if you're an ag producer that's shutting down, like you should be able to make money off of selling your private property, right? But at the same time, there's an argument that says we should not sell the Valley's water rights or wherever yeah. to another area outside of us. So it's really interesting because on one hand, you got the conservative side of the argument where they're like, it's all about private property and your personal rights and your private property rights, but we don't want you to sell this water. And then on the other side, you have the, the the more democrat side that's like you know water shouldn't be a private property right so we should let these farmers sell their water for a profit because it's their private property right you know yeah it's, it's a very conflicting argument but that's what he spoke about well and we wanted to have um i got a little bit of pushback on it but yep. we want to have these conversations this is the best place to do it is start to have yep. so everybody understands what we're talking about because this next legislative session is going to be a bare knuckle brawl on a whole lot of issues. Well, I was, I've been thinking about it and as a good thing, and maybe it's not the best thing, but really you think about everyone, I think about all the faces that are in that room, especially on Friday. Every one of them is the type of person that, if you can make a reasonable argument, I'll at least listen to you. Yeah. yeah. Every yeah, single absolutely. one of them. Yeah, there's any, one or two that maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, that, that's a bit of a blanket yeah, statement, but yeah. I mean, but by and large, that was the case. And yeah. Like yeah. I said, maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing because. No, I think it's a good thing. We have to have these conversations. It, 
and I, I liked that um, James at the beginning of it, he he said like this was the the indigenous people that lived here. So when we say this is our land, it's not our land, right? You know, and he and he he kind of went through that. He's like, we're privileged to be here, but we have to remember this was not our land. This so was when he not claimed this is ours. like you know, this is my Colorado. We're not from Colorado. And I, yeah. I appreciate that. And I get why he did that, but yeah, uh, he's, no, he is right. He, and he's, and he's so great. Um, I think the world of him, you know, uh, the governor came in next, um, right after yeah. him. So I had to actually go and listen to James, um, presentation again, and we're going to have this out on YouTube here very shortly. Um, that being said, um, the governor came in and it was it was an interesting it was an interesting dynamic because he didn't have a fully friendly room yeah, right. down there. But he took the question, but he took the question. And so right before we go down, he goes, what are we talking about now? I'd have conversations with his staff and everything. So he knew but he's always really great with me at events is he checks in with me regardless of whatever front stuff yeah. was. I was like, Team Colorado, we've got to build Team Colorado. Yeah. And so he carried that. Um, and I see, he goes, and we're going to do questions. I go, it's up to you, but I wouldn't recommend it. He's like, we're, we're doing questions. I was like, all right, yeah, whatever you want no, to do. But, yeah. um, I, I, you know, I mean, he's the governor. He's going to, he can do whatever yeah. he wants on the questions. Um, and, and nobody, nobody pulled punches with him in the room. No, um, no, not at all. What the one thing I, I, my big takeaway was this, cause I heard it over and over again afterwards is he said, there's no he doesn't see an urban rural divide and I know what he meant, but I know also know how it was taken. Yeah. So let me also yeah. say I heard him <laughs> say I heard him say without rural there's no Colorado yeah. that the food water and energy comes and we have to figure out a way to work together on it. But rural sees that but urban does not see that. Yes. Right. And he's coming from an urban area. And I know I know he means well and he's right in what he says. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like he can say that, but if you go to like downtown Denver, nobody's gonna give two flying, you know, yep, what exactly. about rural Colorado. And, and that that was one thing that somebody brought up because they asked him, they're like, There is this divide. And he's like, I don't see it. We're all on the same team. But they kind of asked him, was like, Well, you need to be more vocal about that in front of the urban areas and i agree with that like he yeah. needs to be and he is an advocate for rural colorado but he needs to be an advocate more towards that urban and like keep those talking points there but yeah, yeah. um but he did a good job and we appreciate him because he actually is very generous with his time and effort and everything yeah. and very accessible there's not a time that he comes this way that he doesn't reach out to us or vice versa within moments yeah um, so so moving along because i want to get to our sponsors oh yeah yep, time. yep yep so afterwards we had jamie rico who we already spoke yep, about yep. that was great she was great then we had micah who will do a whole show on that <laughs> yeah. <after dark>. so <laughs> we'll skip him right now skip him. but then we got to the o'neill group yes and that was kevin o'neill um, entrepreneur like investor out of colorado springs started the catalyst campus which is kind of like a think tank and they contract with like boeing the dod the air force space force and kind of set up a business incubator for businesses that work on projects that could be um, important to the defense industry, the aerospace industry, actually anything really, manufacturing, and they're looking to expand in Southern Colorado. But they do more than just a, a business incubator. It's an yes. education piece. It, it's like a it's like a college, a lab, an incubator, and a think tank yeah. all in one. So you go to the Catalyst campus, and there's like twenty seven groups of people working on stuff from intelligence space laser ufo stuff to you know business development and manufacturing yeah so, so yeah so they have like an incubator side and an accelerator side for yeah. these businesses oh and and i can't i can't remember if he talked about it in his comments or if, if it was in here he and i were talking later but he told me that one of the most surprising things that have, has happened is how much collaboration starts happening between these companies yes who come to him as an incubator and accelerator mm. all of a sudden they're like oh we're doing something similar maybe we can it's a catalyst. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing. It's the what catalyst doing. campus. Yeah, yeah. Well, and something that you had talked about in your remarks that really felt uh, followed through with what he's doing, and I don't know if you even knew it ahead of time, but really applying some business principles to education yes. and a, some business models to education. It's very innovative. Yeah, yeah. And um, he, um, I talked to him a little more about it. So he wants to take a large group of Action Twenty Two members up to the Catalyst campus. And we can set that up. So any members of Action 22 that want to go on this, 
he'll do a full day tour. Oh, and yeah. they have a lot of like top secret stuff, but he says we we've got to book it ahead of time and they cover stuff up. But we'll go in and see what they're actually doing and how it works. And yeah. I think that'll be important. Um, oh, we're so in. Pro- <laughs> probably like springtime. Yeah. I've, I've been there been there like 20 times and it's such a great place. We're yeah. so in. We're um, so in on that. And then, uh, you know, he, he kind of wrapped up the day there. And and the following day we had our workshops. We had Dola and Oedic oh, yeah. come in and just kind of talk about the ARPA funds and what's coming down. And that was more of a Q&A. So it was a true workshop where... Yeah, people with concerns and questions. And Dave Young, who we just yeah, adore. Yeah, Dave Young, yeah, the treasurer, came We in. just adore him. He's great. But the, the most important part, this would not have happened without our sponsors. Yeah, will you go through those and talk about our sponsors? Yeah, so when we put these on, um, we need sponsorship, right? Um, we can't do this. We all work really hard for a little bit of money, and, the, and it takes money to do this. And so we approach our sponsors and in the past it's, you know, we, we get a few this year, we got so many. And, and I think that was kind of a sign of the times um, also with how important of what action 20 do at what action 22 does for the area. So we'll just go through the list and yep. thank all of our sponsors and we'll have, we'll have them on our website and stuff. But yeah, the city, the city of Trinidad, Trinidad state, XL energy, AT&T, um, Phil Long Toyota, Tri-State, Connect for Health Colorado, Dave Young, Chaffa, Mike Beasley, our beloved lobbyist. We love him um, so much. Uh, WGU was at Western Governors Western University. Governor. Um, Pinnacle Insurance, the Capital Success Group, Goal High School. They did a great job. They they handled the like video part of it. Um, they always help us out with that, and they did. It, it looked it very was professional. So yeah. professional. Yeah, I mean, it's better than like professional stuff you see. Yeah, you know? seriously. Um, CU sponsored us, New Elk Coal. Um, go down here. The Farm Bureau of Colorado, of course. They're, they've always been supporters. Um, Coloradoans for Responsible Energy Development. The Munch Group, our Munch Government Relations. CREA, Colorado Rural Electric Association. Outshine Energy and CASA, Colorado Solar Storage Association. Black Hills Energy. Phil Long Enterprises, that's the other one that right. yep. Gratis Charters, that's their um, their advocacy side or their- Right, their community. Philo- yeah. yeah, their community. And then of course, my favorite, Christine Arbogast with uh, Kagosik and Associates. She, yes. she came in and she was so sad she couldn't make it, but um, she's, most people know Christine, if you have anything to do with water, she's a president in the um, National Water Right- Rights Association she's here in colorado she's such a great resource and she um does more than anybody i know when it comes to water in colorado so that that's our list of sponsors and that just goes to how well supported we are so there's two things we're going to do as we wrap up today um there's two things that uh we really want to do to follow through and carry um this carry this into our next year uh we we kind of experiment a lot. If you're if you're familiar with Action 22, we're going to try things on and see what works and see what doesn't. And we had a lot of really positive takeaways. Um, Phil Rico, the mayor down there, worked really hard. Um, that entire we had so much really great support from them. So um, I guess there's three things. One is every other year when it's not an election year, we want to do one of these community highlight events where we're going and we're having fun together and we're learning and, and we're doing that. Um, number two, and this is gonna be really, really important, in the next six to seven months or so, we're gonna be working with Phil Weiser and his team to uh, do all of these workshops. Uh, accessing the ARP funds right now, and in, in Colorado, it's particularly um, complicated. And it's, it's for good reasons. There's a dole and there's a no edit. But we're still having trouble trying to figure out how to access funds. And that was what those two workshops were about. Access and understand. Access and understand. Thank you. Access and understand. So we're going to be doing some, um, we're going to be doing a learning series. And it's going to be evolving because what we know and understand about them is evolving. So we're going to do a series of visits, a roadshow, if you will, around the state. And we'll be working with them on that. The last thing that we were talking about is really how we carry the the action talks were so much more impactful than yeah. we had expected them mm-hmm. to. 
we want to try to do those maybe twice a year. So we want to try to do those, um, do one maybe in the spring in February or March, and then do one that's associated with the annual meeting. We yeah. just loved this so yeah. much. Um, and then again, we did a reception afterwards. We were so taken back by this, like the collaborations, Carl Dakin had come in and he was talking about um, I had met him a couple of years ago. He had joined, he actually joined Action 22 last week yeah. <laughs> and then signed up for the conference. Yep. So he did that at the same time. And he, um, he just helps these projects find funding. He's just the funding finding guy. And that, that guy has his hands in more things across the spectrum than anybody I've ever met. He was talking to me about our projects to the biochar with uh, Lat, yeah, Lat, Williams. Lat Williams. Yeah, yeah, Lat Williams. He was talking to him. So like community development and then housing. It was like there, everything that we're talking about. He's like, oh yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. So, and I was like, wow, we just we just got a heavy hitter yeah. joint action 22 for some really cool things. And I think that's the other part of it is that um, a lot of things are going to get lost, um, but we're going to try to carry this through um, for this next year. So join us next week uh, as we talk about a few more of these issues. We don't know exactly who our guest is going to be next week, but uh, let us know what you think. Yeah, you can get a hold of us at any time at show at action22.org. We'll see you guys next week. Bye, everyone.